This past couple of weeks, I've been thinking a lot about the presidential election. Anyone else? <laughs> the past couple of weeks, we had two major things happen. One, we had the assassination attempt on President Trump, which killed one person and injured others. And then we had the President of the United States choose to exit the race. And so we have an entirely new race for the President. One thing we can say is that politics is not boring. But there was a third event that happened that I think is just as important, and in one sense, even more important, that happened right between those. Such an event did not get much press coverage. That event is the National Eucharistic Congress. The timing of the Congress, I believe, was providential. And I believe the Congress itself is instructive for us, or it gives us a perspective from which to understand what's going on in our culture, but more specifically, to help us to weather the cultural and political storm that we're experiencing. This is important because I believe the chief danger for us as Christians is to understand what's happening in politics with merely human eyes. The temptation to see it only with human eyes or to see it with eyes that, that do not have any reference to God, kind of an atheistic perspective. That's the chief danger because we miss what God is doing. God is doing something supernatural. And I believe that's what Jesus is doing in today's gospel, right? Jesus in today's gospel is showing that he's up to something supernatural in the context of what naturally seems impossible, right? So the context is that there are 5,000 men who are in this large crowd, not counting women and children. So there's a lot of people in this crowd. And he turns to Philip and asks him a provocative question. He says, where can we find enough food for them to eat? He was saying this to test Philip, right? And Philip responds, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to even have a little, or each of them to have a little. It's almost as if Jesus was saying to Philip after that, exactly, exactly, you can't do this. Humanity can't do this. This problem of this whole crowd being hungry cannot be solved by human ingenuity or human power. And so as a result, what does he do? Jesus takes from what they have, which is just five loaves and two fish, and he multiplies them with supernatural abundance and is, has enough to feed everyone with there being all of this leftover. Right? So God is responding supernaturally to a situation that seems impossible from a human perspective. And so as we look out perhaps today in our culture, what we need to remember is that the key part of this passage is that, is that Jesus was intending something supernatural, but Philip couldn't see it. Philip couldn't have seen it. And it's really tempting for us to make sure that we are looking at this from a supernatural perspective. It's almost as if Jesus walks up to us and tests us. Imagine him coming up to us and testing us and says, and, and, and basically says something like this, where can we find enough votes to elect the people who will solve all of these problems. Sounds silly, doesn't it? But that's the, precisely the temptation that we're going through. That's precisely the temptation that we experience in a culture that only sees things from a human perspective, that sees our problems in terms of politics. This is what happens when we, when we listen to the media in their approach. And this is even what we hear from Christians who have been infected by a worldly way of looking at problems. My brothers and sisters, what if Jesus is intending something supernatural? What if as we look at the presidential election, at the general election, we look at the demise of our culture, Jesus is about to do something? What if he's really intending something supernatural that can respond to what's going on? I believe the National Eucharistic Congress is one way of seeing what God is intending. And it's, it is on full display in the National Eucharistic Congress what the God of abundance is doing. And I actually would say that the, the Congress, for those of you who don't remember, it's, it, it, it came in the context of the three-year National Eucharistic Revival. The three-year National Eucharistic Revival essentially was a revival to renew the church by enkindling a living relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And so in the, in the third year of the revival, they would have this National Eucharistic Congress, which was kind of like the climax of the revival before we send people out as Eucharistic missionaries. And so before I talk about what happened at the Congress, I want to just simply say that the Congress wasn't perfect. 
You know, you, you can probably find you know, your, your usual suspects online who are hypercritical about everything going on in the church, in the name of the church, right? You can find them probably criticizing some parts of it. And by the way, it's not really a virtue to be able to always criticize and find out shortcomings of things. The virtue really is, is to be able to see the shortcomings and the imperfections and see God's goodness and his love in the midst of it. Amen? Amen. But the reality is, my brothers and sisters, the Congress was an extraordinary event. I already had high expectations because as a National Eucharistic preacher, I preached and I helped people to be prepared for this event. But it far exceeded my expectations. I mean, think about it. We had attendance about 60,000 people at, at one point or another um, come to this. Over 1,100, about 1,100 priests, 1,200 religious, 200 bishops, people from every culture and language in the, it seems like every culture and language in the United States, with families, there's diversity of different liturgical preferences, everyone coming together in one place to celebrate the Eucharist, to worship our Lord Jesus Christ, to be renewed in his love, and to be sent out for the culture to transform the culture in Christ. It was a really powerful event. And so mo much of the large sessions were done at Lucas Oil Stadium, where the Indianapolis Colts play. And so they had large sessions, they had different tracks for priests and youth, they had a clergy track, I'm sorry, they had a clergy track, a youth track, they had a renewal track and an encounter track, um, not encounter ministries, but just an encounter, like encountering the Lord. Um, and it was really powerful. Um, I was actually invited to speak at one of the, um, the main sessions on Friday morning um, in front of 30,000 people. I have to be honest, it's actually much more nerve-wracking preaching in front of you than 30,000 people, because you know me, right? <laughs> But it was really powerful, like Dr. Mary Healy and I did some prayer and we prayed for people to experience God's love and, and inner healing and even physical healing. And the, at the last mass where the papal representative was there, um, Bishop Cousins, the one who actually led the whole uh, Congress, said to me, Father, I heard that your prayer session was great. There was, there was someone who testified that their blindness or their, their he sight was restored. And we heard testimonies all over. I got a video recently of a woman who had damage to her optic nerve and could not see at all. And at that prayer session, she was completely able to see, which doctors say your optic nerve does not grow back, right? So God was doing miraculous things. But in addition to that, I, I gave a breakout and Bishop Boye actually introduced me, which was really, it was kind of funny to have the bishop introduce me. Um, but what was powerful about it above all were the evenings of adoration where we had Tens of thousands of people packed in Lucas Oil Stadium, all the lights are off, with the exception of like 30 spotlights on the Blessed Sacrament in the middle, where we worship God, sometimes in high praise of God, right? Which is, again, a, a bizarre thing to experience in a sports stadium. People aren't cheering the touchdown. They're not cheering a basketball hoop. They're cheering the Lord of life who's conquered death. Right? There's this praise of God welling up, and then there's periods of silence where you could hear a pin drop. It was so silent that you could hear a baby across the stadium crying. It was a powerful moment, and we had litanies of repentance and litanies of healing. We had a litany of healing. Uh, we're, we're repenting. We're worshiping the Lord. It's a very powerful moment. And I would say that the joy and faith at this Congress was, in, or was, was very palpable. One of the people that were at the Congress says it was like a taste of heaven. And there's a parishioner, an older parishioner who's, uh, who's here, she said, this could change our church. This could change our country. My brothers and sisters, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that what happened at the National Eucharistic Congress could be a, a potentially a watershed moment for the church where the church refocuses her heart and her faith on the living Lord who is with us in the Eucharist, a Lord who can convert us, a Lord who can transform us so that we can go out and transform the culture that desperately needs him. I truly believe that this is what's possible because after all, Jesus' love cannot lose in an election. Amen? Amen? Jesus loves us and there's nothing the culture can do about it. Jesus is a Lord and there's nothing that the culture can do about it. And we, empowered by his love, can bring that hope to the world that desperately needs it. And I truly think, therefore, is that while many around us are looking at the problems of our country, looking at the prospects of a Harris presidency, the pro prospects of a Trump presidency, as they look at these problems with human eyes, perhaps with atheistic eyes, 
We as Christians know that the solution to our problems is not merely natural. The solution to our problems is the superabundance of God who is at work. And it's from this supernatural perspective, this union with God who empowers us, who loves us, who brings light into the darkness of our lives. It's from that human perspective then that we can go forth to advance the kingdom of God. It is from there that we can go forth and engage the world in politics, engage the world in trying to vote for the proper people to get into office. But when we get those mixed up, when we get that order completely opposite, when we put politics above our faith, politics above what God is doing in our own life, not only is that idolatry, but that is a recipe for anxiety and fear. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is intending to do something great. He has supernatural intendance and, not a, and, and he's intending something supernatural. And so out of the abundance of his love, let's focus on what he's doing. And so as we come forward to receive Jesus in Holy Communion, let's, if we may, repent from trying to understand all what's going on with just simply natural eyes. Let's repent for thinking that somehow the presidential election, the general election is going to solve all of our problems. And let's give to him our fears, our, our concerns, our worry, and allow him to love us, to give us new eyes to see what he is doing so that we can be empowered to bring real hope to the world, hope that can never come from an election.